Are you interested in primary care, but concerned that you won't make enough as a primary care physician to pay off your student debt? Listen in. Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine may have the solution for you, and Geisinger's Dean of Admissions is going to tell us all about it. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Acceptance founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Do you know how to get accepted to medical school? Dr. Susie Schweikert does, and she shares her knowledge and insight and accepts its free guide, Med School Admissions, What You Need to Know to Get Accepted. Download your free copy at accepted.com slash 343 download. Today's guest, Dr. Michelle Schmoody, has spent her career in higher ed administration and med school admissions. After earning her bachelor's in history and business, she went on to earn an MBA and then a doctorate in education from Wilkes University. Since 1996, she has worked in admissions, first as Dean of Full-Time Admissions at Point Park University, then at King's College, and since 2015 as Director and then as Associate Dean of Admissions, Enrollment Management, and Financial Aid at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. She is also an Associate Professor of Medicine at Geisinger. Now that you know a little about Dr. Schmoody, let's find out about Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine and its admissions policies. Dr. Schmoody, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Thank you so much for having me here today. Delighted from my end. Okay, can you give us, let's start with just an overview of the Geisinger Commonwealth Med School program, if you could just focus on the more distinctive elements. Sure. Uh, Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine was founded in 2008, and we welcomed our first class of medical school students in 2009. And so I believe that there are some key hallmark programs that make us unique in the marketplace for a medical school degree. And so first and foremost would be our 100 hour community service requirement. And this is part and parcel um, and goes along with the mission of the institution, which we are a community-based medical school. Um, and so having um, admitting students that align with the mission of the institution and who are passionate about community service um, is something that we take seriously and our students engage in a minimum of 100 hours of community service during their four years with us. So that's extremely important to us and very mission focused. Um, another uh, hallmark of our medical school program would be our family centered experience, which pairs our medical students with those individuals in the community who are experiencing chronic illness and so they walk with them throughout their journey um, and they really get to see life on the other side and it helps them to grow in empathy, compassion, kindness, and caring. And so when we look to admit future physicians who will be patient-centered, clearly those characteristics um, of kindness, caring, empathy, and compassion all relate to patient-centered medicine and can be found within our family-centered experience. Another key aspect of our medical school program would be our two research programs that our students engage in during years one and years three. And the first program is a community health intervention research project that our students engage in. Again, partnering with local organizations, healthcare organizations, um, to really help them identify community needs and community interventions. Our second is in our third year, which our students complete a quality improvement research project. Again, working with the local community um, to help them um, address these issues and put in place um, some interventions to help address whatever issue they're dealing with at the time. Okay, that's quite a bit. Um, you mentioned community service. Now, by community service, do you mean non-clinical community service or does that tend to be clinical or does it matter? Um, most of it is actually non-clinical and so our students engage in a variety, but they are really involved 
um, with the community. And I'll give you a, for instance, a few weeks ago, our students hosted a turkey trot, which is an annual event. And we raised almost $18,000 and donated on a yearly basis to the Friends of the Poor. And so our students are really focused on giving back to the community. And so they engage in a plethora of events. They do Alley for Autism, where they're raising funds for autism awareness. Um, they do things, uh, community service events inside the school, outside of the school. We host um, a health fair for the local community. We do a trick or treat event for the um, the children in our community, we so that it's safe for them. We bring them into the institution and we transform it into a haunted hallway. So again, the the children are safe and we're providing a meaningful experience for them. So those are just a few of the community service activities that we do engage in. Um, some of our students do participate and they volunteer at clinics, free clinics within the area. So they do that as well. Okay, great. Um, what is the distributed campus model that I think is really important to, to Geisinger and very distinctive about it? And how does it shape the medical st student experience at Geisinger? Sure. So our regional distributed campus model um, is such that, and so the first two years of a student's medical school experience is spent here in Scranton. And so again, their first two years here in Scranton, and then during their third and fourth year, they're out in their regional campus and they are participating in their clinical rotations during their third year. During their fourth year, they're also um, participating in rotations and then they are also doing away rotations um, where they will visit other uh, clinical environments to experience their the um, training at their respective place. So our students might go to, were you gonna ask a question? I was gonna ask, if, are all the away rotations in the Geisinger network or are they anywhere? Um, they're anywhere, and so students actually go through a process, an application process, to apply to these um, away rotations, and then upon acceptance, they will actually go and spend time at other um, clinical venues. Okay. Now, when I was preparing for the call, there were a couple of things about the curriculum that really caught my eye. And one is one of them was longitudinal integrated curriculum. And you mentioned there's also a longitudinal longitudinal integrated clerkship. So what are what are those? Sure. The longitudinal integrated curriculum actually happens during the third year. And during the third year, our students par are participating in their clinical rotations, mm -hmm. which are housed at their regional campus. And so six months of their clinical rotations during their third year, they participate in what's called a longitudinal integrated clerkship, meaning that over the course of the six months, they will rotate through the six core disciplines of medicine once a week. And so take, for instance, a schedule might be on Monday, I might be doing a rotation for internal medicine, and on Monday afternoon, I might go to pediatrics. On Tuesday morning, I might do a surgery rotation. Now this is set. And then the following week, it would have, they would have the exact same schedule. So they participate in their six core disciplines of medicine weekly, as opposed to the other six months where they're in a traditional block format rotation where they will spend time on one discipline of medicine and then go into another. So I will spend uninterrupted time in pediatrics. When I'm done with pediatrics, I will go to my next clinical rotation, which may be internal medicine or family medicine. Again, they're scheduled in advance. But the block, you're specifically focused on one discipline of medicine, whereas in the Longitudinal Integrated Clerkship, also known as an LIC, you're going to that clerkship weekly. Okay. Does that make sense? So the, during this Longitudinal Clerkship, you don't focus. You're constantly exposed to the different 
six core elements, correct? That's correct. And so what it allows a student, uh, um, a medical student to do is a few things. Um, number one, uh, it creates continuity of care. Um, number two, it allows the students to build relationships, not only with their clinical mentor, but also with the patients that they see, because it's over a six month time for mm -hmm. period, as opposed to a block, which is a specific amount of time that's short in nature. Got it. Got it. And does the longitudinal clerkship come before the more focused clerkships or is it the other way around or does it matter? They're not, is it half and half? It is half and half. And okay. so um, half of our medical students during the third year will participate in the longitudinal integrated clerkship first, and then they will do their block. And then the other half of the students will flip flop. And so they will have the block rotations first, and then um, they will switch into the longitudinal integrated clerkship. Got it. Okay. And I think there's also a longitudinal integrated curriculum element at Geisinger, right? I thought well, I saw those that. Two, those two, um, so Block and the longitudinal integrated clerkship actually comprise the longitudinal integrated curriculum. Got it. Okay. Got it now. All right. So that's clear. What is the ePortfolio and how does it help med students? I think you were involved in creating it, right? I was involved in creating it along with my colleague, Dr. Tanya Adonisio, who is the Associate Dean of Student Affairs and an Assistant Professor of Medicine, and our former Vice Dean, Dr. William Yokes, who now um, collaborates with the ACGME. And so the ePortfolio is designed to track a student's professional identity formation across their four years of medical school. And so what this allows for is um, their ePortfolio coach to collaborate with the students to help them track this growth because at the end of the day, we are looking to produce reflective practitioners. And an ePortfolio and the reflections contained along with other assessments and other um, pieces of evidence that students put into the ePortfolio from our professional identity formation curriculum, help them to track, to monitor, and to reflect on their own growth in terms of their identity as a future physician. And how does it work? I mean, are they journaling as part of this? Um, is there a set of, me of meetings with uh, mentors? Sure. So we actually have embedded with our within the medical school curriculum uh, professional identity formation curriculum, and there are various um, assessments contained within this professional identity formation curriculum. And those assessments um, are required, and then the student will utilize those assessments, and then they will put them into the ePortfolio so that the ePortfolio coach can work with that student to, again, to um, help to monitor, but to also help them work toward continual growth in terms of their identity as a future physician. And in terms of the identity, is that also focused on the, the values that you were talking about initially, you know, the caring, compassion, empathy part? Is that... I, I'm going to guess that's part of this. It, it absolutely is part of our professional identity formation curriculum. Okay. And so, therefore, the artifacts are uploaded into the ePortfolio that tracks and promotes the professionalism and professional identity formation of the medical students. Okay. What is the Geisinger Primary Care Scholars Program, and how can it help Geisinger students graduate? That free. Sure. Well, this is extremely exciting. Yeah. Um, I published an article on it, and our dean of the medical school and um, the chief executive officer of the Geisinger Health System, Dr. J. Wan Ru, they have also published an article about the Abigail Geisinger Scholars Program. So um, let me explain. Uh, 
let me give you an overview. Okay. So we have the Geisinger Scholars Program. And within the Geisinger Scholars Program, we have two opportunities for students to come out of medical school debt free. So the first is um, our Abigail Geisinger Scholars Program, which we launched in the spring of 2019 to our current students. Um, and then also in the fall of 2019, we opened it up for our first year medical class. And so each and every year, we award to 10 incoming students um, the Abigail, they are awarded the Abigail Geisinger Scholars Program. And what that covers is tuition and fees um, for up to four years. And so if you are an Abigail Geisinger Scholar, scholar and you come into our medical school and we give you four years of tuition and fees, you will give us four years of service post-residency within the Geisinger healthcare system. The Abigail Geisinger Scholars Program is open to all specialties, so it's not um, specifically focused on one. We just launched and we will uh, be announcing our Geisinger Primary Care Scholars in a few weeks. Um, for our current students, and this will become available to the incoming MD class of 2024, we will award 40 Geisinger Primary Care uh, Scholar Awards, and that will cover tuition fees and provide a $2,000 a month stipend while enrolled in medical school. So, and that is along the same lines of the Abigail Geisinger Scholars Program in the sense that if we fund you for four, if we cover your four years of tuition and fees and give you $2,000 a month in a stipend, you will then give us the four years of service post-residency. However, we do have specific specialties that this program is limited to. Got it. And those specialties are family medicine, internal medicine, and medicine pediatrics. And again, we will award 40 to each so incoming almost, class. Almost half your class, right? Your half your, your classes, I, I, I have a note here that's 115 students. So that's, that's correct. I mean, 10 and 40 is 50, that's almost half. Um, that's, that's a very good percentage of the class. It really is. We're very proud yeah. of these two programs <laughs> in our efforts to reduce medical student debt and to mitigate the physician shortage within our uh, primary service area. So we're really excited about this. And it's specifically mission focused and uh, we, we are helping our local community. So just to make sure I get the differences between them. So the Abigail Geisinger Scholars is for any specialty, right? The first one, the one That's for correct. 10. The one for 40 is specifically for, for certain primary care, right? Internal, I think you said family medicine, internal medicine. Family medicine, yes. Internal medicine and, medicine and, and, pediatrics. and pediatrics, So, but not OBGYN. No, it, we, no, we have to be specific. It's not just pediatrics, it's medicine pediatrics. So okay. it would be family medicine is one, two is internal medicine, and three is medicine pediatrics, which is a residency in and of itself. Um, but it does not include pediatrics or um, obstetrics and gynecology. Okay. All right. And and the the one for the for the second one, the primary care scholars program, that also includes a stipend. I didn't catch whether the That's Abigail correct. Geisinger does that include a stipend also, or is that tuition only? Uh, it's tuition and fees only um, for the Abigail Geisinger Scholars Program, and it's in addition for the Geisinger Primary Care Scholars Program it's the additional $2,000 a month while enrolled in medical school. Right, right, that's fantastic. And um, okay, that, that is a fantastic opportunity for those interested in, in primary care. There's no, no question about it, and in particular in, in, in your community. Um, let's turn to the Geisinger application. What is the Geisinger secondary like, and do you require the CASPER? Sure. So our guys, uh, the secondary application is definitely very mission focused and mission driven. Um, we were, uh, again, I, I mentioned before, we were founded in 2008 and we welcomed our first class in 2009. And we have a very specific mission in mind 
um, with an intent to help repopulate the physician shortage in this area. And so um, our secondary really focuses on um, patient-centered medicine, um, dedication to community service, your um, ability to work effectively and efficiently within an interprofessional healthcare team, and uh, utilizing evidence-based research to, um, to deliver care. And so those four pillars of our mission really help to inform our secondary and um, mission alignment for the students that we're looking to enroll at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. And how, how do you define your geographic community? Sure, so our geographic community includes our primary service area. So the um, counties uh, that the medical school serves as well as the clinical delivery system of Geisinger. Which is like Northeast Pennsylvania and parts of New Jersey, parts of New York that's, State? That's or? correct. And, and there are a, a few um, counties that we also serve in um, Southeast Pennsylvania as well. Got it. Okay. Is the CASPER required? CASPER is not required um, at this point. However, um, our interview um, is a traditional interview in nature. And so when our students are offered an interview, we they partake in an interview with a faculty member as well as a student. So students are part and parcel in the decision-making process of um, who will be their colleagues in the upcoming year. And so we do have a traditional format. However, we are looking and we are researching at the multiple mini interview mm -hmm. and to determine if that best aligns with selecting applicants who best meet the mission of Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. So stay tuned on the multiple mini interview and CASPER, because I am very interested in CASPER. Um, and I believe that the CASPER um, assessment provides valuable insight to medical schools about candidates. Right. I was interviewing Jennifer Welch a few weeks or months ago at this point, it probably is, you know, from SUNY Upstate. And she said that she finds that the CASPER is very helpful in determining who should get interviews um, and that she would never go back to the traditional uh, interview after using the multiple mini interview. Uh, so anyway, but that seems I believe to be. That, uh, I believe that there um, are many benefits of using a multiple mini interview. So stay tuned on that. Okay. Maybe we can have a follow-up for... <laughs> once I have some more information on that. Okay, that's fine. But for this year, it's a traditional interview, right? It is, and it's traditional interview, and we're not utilizing Casper. Again, I see Got the it. value of both Casper as well as the multiple mini interview. But you're thinking about it. Yes. Okay. Um, do you want students, you admit, to have both research experience and clinical exposure? Is one more important than the other? I will actually say that we focus on um, community service and clinical exposure. Okay. So if you, and again, that ties back to our mission. Um, however, if a student has um, wonderful exposure to clinical experiences and is dedicated to community service and has a passion for research, then I think that um, they are a well-rounded applicant. Okay. All right, fine. Now, Geisinger received last year 5,780 applicants for its class of 115 students. It sends out automatic secondaries, so obviously you've got a ton of secondaries. Um, the MSAR says that Geisinger interviewed 763 students. How do you win it with down from 5,780 to 763? Sure. So we subscribe to a holistic admission process, which means we look at a candidate's metrics, their attributes, and their experiences, and in particular, the experiences and how they align with the mission of the institution. So um, looking at the gestalt of the application, um, that helps us to determine those students who are most aligned with the mission of the institution, um, who um, have the IQ um, as well as the EQ, the emotional intelligence, to succeed at our institution. 
All right, so you're so you're looking at a, a whole package. And one thing we that are. you mentioned again and again in, in this interview is that you're a mission-driven school and the importance of community service. So obviously that's going to play a major role in your evaluation. Am I correct? You are correct. Okay. How do you view letters of intent or correspondence either from applicants who sent in secondaries and haven't heard from you or from those who've interviewed and haven't heard from you or those who are waitlisted? Sure. So we encourage a student to submit up to two updates to us. And what I would suggest a student does um, and what they should include in those update letters are meaningful experiences that they've engaged in since the time of submitting their primary application and their secondary application. So if they haven't heard from us um, and they've submitted both of those, providing us with meaning, a meaningful update letter containing those experiences from the time of submission to then, to that point, um, is much appreciated. Okay. Um, they can also then submit, let's say they've interviewed and they've been waitlisted. They can certainly utilize their second update to provide us with additional experiences that they've been engaged in so that we have the full picture of a student's um, experiences. And by limiting it to two, you're also basically um, making sure that they are meaningful. That's correct. Yeah, okay. On a forward-looking note, what advice would you give to medical school applicants thinking ahead and planning to apply in 2020 to join the class entering in 2021? So it's six months away. Sure. So I would say to students applying to medical school is to apply when you have the best application possible. The medical school application is costly and it's long. And to just try it is not a strategy. You need to go into the application process for medical school with your best application. And that means your best metrics and your best experiences. And so I always ask students to reflect and look at their package and say, what can I improve upon? And to identify areas of improvement and improve those areas before they actually apply to medical school. Again, um, it is, um, it's a costly process, again, financially, but also mentally. And so making sure that you have the best application will help students through the process. Right, that's great advice. I hear um, from so many students that, well, I just tried it. Just trying it is not a strategy. Um, and so I really, I, I discourage students from just trying it. I encourage students to put their best application forward. Isn't there a saying, a goal without a plan is a wish? That would be correct. <laughs> right, and I think it applies with, that's not a plan either, just trying it. I think the kind of assessment, exactly. that, you're, the kind of assessment that you're recommending is absolutely necessary. Um, it, it really is. And, you know, I think that we do this in all parts of our life where if we're looking for a promotion or if we're looking for a career change or if we're looking to do something different. So what are our strengths? What are we bringing to the table? And what areas do we need to improve upon that will align with our future goals? And so when you do that, um, then you know that you're putting your best foot forward or your best application forward or, um, you know, whatever you're doing in life. Right. And the other thing, I, I don't know if I've talked to different admissions people. And I don't know if you feel this, but if if you just try it, OK, and then you and then you have to reapply and maybe you improve a little bit, but you still don't make it. And then you reapply again. Your application starts to look a little stale. Um, I don't think I mean, it does. Again, all right. I don't think the medical I, I schools will hold it against you, but still, it's like, you know, you already tried this. Three, three, three strikes, you're out kind of thing. 
Exactly. And, and I, I say to students at that point, you know, it's time to take a pause and reflect and say, is this the right field for me? Okay. Right. And if you take the pause before you start, you're probably ahead of the game. Because what, that's what you're really that recommending. Be, that's exactly what I'm recommending. Let's, let's um, really reflect and look at the evidence that we have to support our application for medical school. And if that um, application packet is solid, then I suggest, then you know that it is the right time. If you say to yourself, well, I can improve here, I can improve there. If you've looked at the profile of an incoming class for the schools that you're looking at, and you are significantly um, below that, you might want to take a step back and say, how can I improve? How can I improve my metrics? How can I improve my experiences? What would you have there liked are, to there are rough, I'm sorry, there are roughly, no, you know, uh, 52 or 53,000 students who apply to allopathic That's medical right. schools each year. And, yeah. you know, 20 to 21,000 get a seat. And so there are many, many students that do. And so the reason why I say, to make sure it's your best application because I want those students um, to be successful and be part of the matriculating class of 2020. Sounds good, great advice. What would you have liked me to ask you? I, I think, you know, obviously I have a passion for the e-portfolio because Dr. Adonisio and I um, have worked for uh, several years on it. We've already discussed that. We really highlighted the mission of the institution. Um, I was able to, you know, talk about our interview format and uh, the research that we're doing for future initiatives. Um, and quite honestly, our Hallmark program, the Geisinger Pri uh, Primary Scholars Program with the Abigail and the Geisinger Primary Care. So I think that we really have exhausted, I would say, I like to say the hallmarks of our school and what makes us unique. And I think I, um, you know, I, I highlighted the community involvement and the community service. And the mission driven aspect of the program, mm -hmm. the importance of that. So, all right, then Absolutely. I think uh, we've, we've done a good job. I think we're almost out of time. I want to thank you. Great. For Can I ask you one question? Sure. Is there anything that you think that I missed that you uh, think needs no, further I mean, clarification? I think I think you covered everything really well. We didn't, you know, we didn't go that much into the secondary, but you said obviously that it relates to the to the mission of the school. One thing I always say, one thing I always say about primaries as opposed to secondaries is the primary is about one's fitness for becoming a physician. The secondary is about fit with a particular program in school. So, you know, that that is absolutely correct. And uh, students who receive our secondary will definitely know right away when they read um, the questions, how they align to the mission of the institution. So it's definitely everything we do is mission driven. So um, we really think about um, the programs that we have, the services that we offer in the context of the mission of the institution. Great. Well, thank you again. I think we're just about out of time. I want to thank you so much for joining me and for sharing your, your expertise and insight. This has been fascinating. Where can listeners learn more about the Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine? Um, you can access our website at geisinger.edu backslash G-C-S-O-M. Again, that's geisinger.edu backslash G-C-S-O-M. Great. Thank you. We'll include links in the show notes at accepted.com slash 343, which might be easier to remember, um, to, to the Geisinger website, as well as to other resources that may be helpful to listeners. Reminder, you can download a complimentary copy of Med School Admissions, What You Need to Know to Get Accepted at accept.com slash 343 download. Grab your copy now. Listener, thank you, too, for joining us for our 343rd episode. If you found this show helpful, can I ask a favor? Could you leave your feedback on iTunes or your favorite podcast site? It helps us to get ranked more highly. We have links at accepted.com slash 343 to our iTunes page, where it is super easy to leave that review. This is Admission Straight Talk, produced by Accepted, and I'm your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week.